The ultimatum by Labour to shut down the nation rings louder in the air. Their demands is that governments address the excruciating mass suffering around the country. We hear from the employees tonight. Deputy Senator Eti Kingabe faults the recent appointment of mandate secretaries into FCT Minister Yesom Wike's cabinet says it is disturbing that people who she describes as aliens of the capital have been appointed. Well, hello and welcome to Politics Today, live on Channels Television. I'm Kyodo Kikulu in Lagos. Well, there's so much to deal with today in the polity, but it's not just in Nigeria, it's across the world. Inflation, rising cost of living, disaffection with government, not to talk of conflict here and there. So leaders are faced with multifaceted challenges, but that's why they're in positions of authority to deal with those challenges, no excuses. And tonight, we'll take a look at one of the major challenges confronting governments in Nigeria easing the economic squeeze, particularly on the vulnerable. What are the issues at stake? Will the federal government and even state government be able to avert a nationwide shutdown? Those are some of the issues on the table tonight. But first, let's begin with a brewing issue that concerns Nigeria's seat of power. That's the nation's capital, Abuja. The senator representing the federal capital territory, Senator Ireti Kingiwe, has taken a swipe at the recently appointed mandate secretaries into FCT Minister Yesom Wiki's cabinet. And she says it is disturbing that persons who have not lived in the nation's capital and are alien to the terrain have been appointed to oversee its development, especially in critical areas. Well, she was speaking at a news conference shortly after the elections tribunal reaffirmed her election. And she said it was unfortunate that such people will learn on the job. But then she also promised to partner with the minister in key sectors. I would like to say between 2015 and 2019 and why FCT has not thrived, you cannot bring mandate secretaries from outside FCT and expect them to excel. Mandate secretaries, if they are zoned, they should be found in the FCT. You can find every zone in FCT, people who have lived here for several years, who are politicians or bureaucrats in the FCT. That is necessary. I remember I was speaking to the Mandate Secretary of Agriculture, or one of them, 2016 or 2017. He didn't even know where Kwali was. It's like taking me now to Bayelsa and deciding that because somebody asked that I be given a slot and then you want to make me a, a, a commissioner of anything in Bayelsa, I wouldn't know where to start. By the time I get acquainted with the place, my tenure is finished. So um, people live in the FCT and just like everything, you need to know the terrain, you need to know the problems, you need to know to be able to solve them. Well, there you have it. So brace up for the first leg of our conversation on the program tonight. They always say a stitch in time saves nine. At the end of last month, Labour had given a 21-day ultimatum and they followed up with a two-day warning strike uh, which they said will be followed by an indefinite strike that will shut down the nation if government does not address the suffering being experienced as a result of the removal of petrol subsidy. And I bet no one wants that to happen. But just before we get into that conversation, let's bring you some more trending political stories. Here's your political roundup. The 
Lagos State Governor Babaji Son Ulu has sworn in 37 new commissioners and new special advisors as members of the State Executive Council. Speaking during the ceremony held at the Government House Ikeja, Lagos, Governor Son Ulu charges the new commissioners to take their role seriously and render their services in the interest of the people. A Yobe State Governor, May Malabuni, has declared his administration zero tolerance for resource wastage and the misallocation of funds that could undermine his efforts in improving the residents' quality of life. Speaking during the swearing-in ceremony of nine newly appointed permanent secretaries at the government house in Damatru, the governor urged them to work with the commissioners to ensure collective achievements in the state's governance and development goals. You are therefore expected to add value from your wealth of experience to the civil service for government to achieve its set goals and to efficiently and effectively deliver, to deliver the required services to our people. Former legislators in the Bielsa State House of Assembly have endorsed Governor Dwey Dewey's bid for a second term in office. The ex-lawmakers under the aegis of the Bielsa Former Legislators Forum passed a vote of confidence on Senator Dewey during a courtesy visit to the government house in Yenagoa. In his response, the Bielsa State Governor Dewey Dewey expressed his appreciation for his endorsement, noting that it would spur him to do more for the state. I want to let you know that that's a very big motivation for this government to continue to do more. First of all, to keep the peace and the unity of this state. Secondly, to tackle the developmental challenges of our state. And ahead of the November 11th off-season governorship elections in Bayelsa, Imo and Kogi states, the national chairman of the African Democratic Party, Mr. Ralph Ngosu, is calling on party members across the affected states to support the governorship candidates of the party. Speaking at a news conference in Abuja, Mr. Ngosu expressed the determination of the National Working Committee of the party to work hand in hand with the state campaign councils to ensure victory for the party. For the last 20 something years, Nigeria doesn't have any local, local government. Without local government, there is no grassroots development. Development goes from the grassroots, it's bottom up. So tonight we're keeping our eye on the ball so the nation is not caught napping. So Labour has given the ultimatum. There's meant to be negotiations going on between Labour and the federal government. While Labour may be speaking for government employees, what about those not employed by government, who, by the way, are way more uh, than civil servants? So let's get a rounded angle to this one. Let's get more sides to this debate. And we're joined on the program by Mr. Adewale Smat Oyeride, who is the Director General, Nigeria Employers Consultative Association, NECA. He joins us live from our Abuja studio. Good evening, and thank you for joining us on Politics Today. Good evening, Kyle. Thank you for having us. Well, it's a big one, really. Yes, a lot of other things are happening, but this is really big because it concerns the livelihoods of majority of Nigerians. Labour's ultimatum is counting down their concerns about what will come out of the negotiations with government. And I wonder, uh, for your association employers, are you factored into this? Let's begin with that. Well, for, for us, it's, um, it's, it, it's something you can call a, a double-edged sword. Um, and in Labour, I had met government um, severally in the past, um, the last being the warning strike, the two days warning strike that was called um, a few days ago. And um, our position remained the same, and it's, it's basically on principle. And it's basically on principle of appropriateness, and the principles that actually guides the environment in which we operate, the labor and employment environment, that if you negotiate, then costly demands that you, um, you live up to the terms of those negotiations. If you can't, for whatever reason, can't meet up with the terms of that negotiation, there is opportunity to renegotiate an agreement that had been negotiated if you don't have the capacity to, to, um, to, to implement. But for us as employers, we had, we had said severally that a strike at this point, because employers are basically paying above the current minimum wage, and employers have also gone beyond the call of duty to provide soccer, to provide, um, I don't want to call it palliatives now, to provide welfare packages to make life easier 
for employers or employees in the private sector. Notwithstanding the fact that employers are currently bleeding, notwithstanding the fact that employers are currently challenged and also facing multidimensional issues as regards operation. But we've done significant to well. And the president also alluded and commended employers in his, in his brokers in, in August um, that we've done quite well. Quite well. Employers have come up with schemes. Um, some have um, increased allowances. Some have um, basically um, reduced salaries. Some have they come up with working from home arrangements to reduce the pressure on employees. So employers, notwithstanding our challenges, we've done significantly well. Now, a strike at this point will do two to three things. One, it will compromise the ability of employers to meet its obligations. Not only to governments to meet its obligations, even to workers. Now, when you go on strike, you know, which is part of the rights of workers, but for us, the fundamental issue is this. Your obligation to government in the context of tax payments, normally it doesn't go on strike and is not suspended during the time of, during the time of strike. Your obligation or employer's obligation to credit to the banks and those that have that have um, that have um, lend or lend a, a business capital, interest payment is not also suspended during the time of strike. Sometimes salary payment is not also is expected not to be suspended during the time of strike. So for employers is double jeopardy when strike is called, especially when we are not the protagonist, when we are not the antagonist, and that remains our position that government should do whatever is necessary to avert the strike. And if the strike should happen, it will be counterproductive for the economy, counterproductive for workers themselves, and also counterproductive for employers. It appears this might be a catch-22 situation. A strike might, of course, as you said, cause a reduction in productivity. But at this time right now, with the removal of subsidy, with shrinking income, disposable income, inflation, people are saying it's even difficult to be productive in the first place. So let's speak to this point. As employers, as I said earlier, you employ way more than even government. I'm talking about the association of employers with you know, businesses from perhaps the nano, micro, small, medium, all that. What will be your demands, if I could use that expression, from government in easing the conditions? Because I imagine even for doing business, it is tough not to talk of people who are employees getting by. Well, for, for us, um, we have, um, first of all, tabled our request, you know, immediate request to the, the government on the, 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 the short-term, medium-term, and long-term request of organized businesses to ameliorate the current challenges that we are currently facing. And those challenges are there for everybody to see. You know, we, we, we said organized businesses currently pays over 60 different taxes at both the federal, state, and local government level. Over 60 different taxes. No, no business survives with that, kind of, with that kind of burden. And there are also so many bills at the National Assembly from the Knight Assembly. Over 21 bills that also has components of employer will pay 0.5%, 0.1% to fund one agency or, or the other. We have the VAT on, on AGO, on diesel, of, of currently, um, currently being proposed. Those are burdens that we have passed to the federal government. And we are glad that we got a response to the inauguration of the Presidential Tax Reform Committee headed by, by, by Taiwo, Taiwo Oedele. Beyond that, we've also communicated the government to deal decisively with the issues of issue of Forex, which is spiking cost of production. So while we do that, we've also appealed to government that whatever you need to do in ameliorating the burden of employees in the public sector that government should do. Now we have the 5 billion Naira um, share to, to states. We have the um, sharing of rice. Is that sufficient? Absolutely not. Is that a step in the right direction? It is a step. Because you have to understand the nexus between the nexus or the nexus between consumption and then production. For us, 5 billion if well spent, moving into a state economy will trigger some level of consumption, 
which will also flow back into production. Because the money that will be shared to Nigerians, whether the most vulnerable, the, 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 uh, the not so vulnerable, and in fact, we are all vulnerable basically at this time. But the five billion that will be shared to those that are called vulnerable, they are not going to eat it as food. They probably use it to buy something, use it to buy consumables, which also feeds into the production system. And as production continues, businesses are in a position to produce for employees and engineers to also buy. As I said, is the current effort, is it sufficient? Absolutely not. Government basically need to do more to ameliorate the challenges that Nigerians are facing currently. So some weeks ago, the president gave that speech where he made some promises, put some timelines to it as well. And I'd just like to get specifics, uh, particularly for businesses, if there's been any movement in that area. Uh, there was a promise of, uh, you know, the MSME support financing in the sum of 125 billion naira to be allocated to MSMEs and the informal sector. Uh, there's also the 75 billion naira startup intervention uh, proposed for 100,000 startups and MSMEs. These are generally targeted at, you know, employment creation ventures. Has there been any activity in that area? Have you heard anything? Is there any chatter whatsoever that you're hearing? Well, not not to to our our hearing for now, not to our knowledge for now. You know, when the pronouncement was made by the president, you know, at that time there was no minister, and we know definitively for you to run that kind of scheme, that expanded scheme for MSMEs, um, intervention for manufacturing and manufacturing concerns, uh, intervention as regard the purchase of buses, you need a structure a working structure at the ministries. You need the Minister for Invest Industry, Trade and Investment to marshal a plan to drive that engagement with manufacturers and MSMEs. You need the Minister for Transport to marshal and drive the conversation about how do we implement the, 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 the purchase of buses and so many other things. At the point where the President made that comment, where he made that pronouncement, no ministers was on ground. And uh, fortunately, we had ministers inaugurated a few, few, few weeks ago and the expectation, and what we have done now, or what we are doing now, is to proactively engage those ministers in all ministries so that the implementation or the framework for implementation can start immediately. While they do that, we have also appealed to government that, look, get the organized private sector involved at the policy, policy formulation stage. Get us involved at the public policy implementation stage and get us involved at the policy appraisal stage so that we can assess if these policies are actually working or if they are not working. But back to your question, we've not seen anything on ground, but definitely we are engaging government at the ministerial level, both at the Ministry of um, Industry, Trade and Investment, Ministry of Labor, Ministry of Transport, to make sure that these pronouncements are giving effect and giving effect to expeditiously. So clearly there's still a lot of work uh, to be done and really time is of the essence. Absolutely. Subsidy has been removed for months Absolutely. now and for a lot of Nigerians, things have to be done yesterday and not today. But uh, just a quick one, I've heard time and again, even employees asking, will the palliatives get to us? Are we going to be a part of these palliatives that will be shared? You, you talked about the five billion allocated to state governments. And I wonder if, you know, NECA is also planning to key into that. Uh, the palliatives. Is that something you're hoping that NECA might get a share or employers generally uh, might get a share of the palliatives? Perhaps that answers a question that a lot of uh, employees have on their minds tonight. Yeah, for, 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 for employers, you know, uh, the, the, the definitive request is let's deal with the policy issues. You know, if you deal with the policy issues, we deal with inflation issues. We deal with the regulatory environment issues. We deal with the legislative environment issues because we still have um, challenges with legislators um, coming up with different onslaught of organized businesses. We have challenges with regulators also coming up with different onslaught of organized businesses. We've mentioned the issue of multiplicity of taxes. We've mentioned the issue of, of access to finance. We've mentioned the issue of a, a hospitable environment for businesses to thrive. For organized businesses, if you deal with those issues, you have sufficiently created an environment that can help a business to be sustainable. Now, we are talking of sustainability now, not competitiveness. 
because you have to be sustainable first before you move into the realm of competitiveness. And our appeal to government is this. In whatever palliative, you know, our palliative will be a structured reduction in the multiplicity of taxes that we currently have. A palliative for a business will be an environment that enables a business to thrive. Because it's when a business thrives that you can talk of generating employment. It's when a business thrives that government can even think of, 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 of generating revenue through tax. It's when a business is thriving that the will of production in the economy can actually drive. You know, it is said, and rightly so, that private sector creates eight out of every ten jobs globally. So if we are to drive this economy out of the woods, if we are to go back to a growth trajectory, then government have to give more attention to the private sector so that we can, we can collectively, all of us, including labor, you know, create an environment that is peaceful for, for, for businesses to, 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 to operate, an environment that is peaceful for wealth to be created, and an environment for wealth to be created, to be shared um, equitably. Right. So two issues I want to quickly deal with as we wind down. Uh, first, should labor go on strike? I mean, we hope not. We hope the issues are, are resolved. It's essentially for civil servants. Doesn't quite concern uh, employees that are employed by members of your association. But that doesn't mean that, I mean, the effect, the ripple effect will not affect operations. Imagine power, for example, and the list goes on and on. Uh, do you... Are you proposing to perhaps be on that table, that negotiating table? I recall I asked earlier, but I didn't quite get a clear uh, direction. Are you proposing to be on the table? Are you on the table? Do you think that will have any impact on the negotiation? I mean, negotiation on the table with government or table, yes. with, uh, table with employers or with our employees? With government. The tripartite uh, arrangement, the negotiation will be seen with federal government and labor. Well, so far... The negotiation that has been held has been bipartite in nature, government and labor. And we are not privy to the dynamics of that conversation. But what we, what we, what we advocate is really a tripartite engagement. Because if you deal with the issue of labor, let's say tomorrow government awards 100,000, make an award of wage, wage award of 100,000 to labor. Now, if you don't deal with the macroeconomic issues that organized businesses are facing, the cost of goods, the high cost of goods and services, will neutralize whatever allocation you have given. So the wisdom is, let the conversation be tripartite. While we are addressing the concerns of labor, you are also addressing the challenges that employers have. As mm -hmm. I said, can I also repeat again, if you deal with one part, you allocate, you make wage awards. Yes. Then, and you don't deal with the issues of cost of production. Whatever award you have made will be neutralized by the increasing cost of production. So you just come back to ground zero. So a tripartite agreement, arrangement, as you mentioned, is desirable, and, and right. that's what we advocate for. On a final note, uh, Mr. Adelo Smart Oyenride, I wonder how did you receive uh, the announcement by government on the president's trip you know, the India trip, G20, those deals, even with the UAE, as local businesses, owners of businesses, employers. How, how did you receive this? Uh, are you receiving it with cautious optimism, perhaps with some concerns? Perhaps this might crowd out the businesses of your members. How, do, how are you receiving this? On a final note. You know, for, for Nigeria is a huge market, you know, very huge market. And um, we, we welcome the effort of the, go of the president, of the government, to attract foreign direct investment. We welcome the efforts to bring in more investors to this country, which is, which is needful, really. But our main concern is this, and we have also communicated at this at different fora. Bring in, let the president spend many months in different countries attracting investors. If we don't resolve the current issues that are bedeviling or stifling organized businesses, those businesses that will come, they will face the same challenge, the same problem that we have created, the same contradiction that exists in the system, they will face the same. Mm. And the same way that we have businesses shutting down, divesting out of this country, those businesses will 
probably also face the same challenges. So it is nice, awesome, beautiful that we are attracting foreign direct investors, but we also want the government to deal with the contradictions in the economy, the contradictions and the challenges that right. organized businesses are facing. If not, we will make much progress with those, um, with those investors. And come to think of it, just a last shot for me. For an investor to bring his capital to this country, he might get a dozier from the Ministry of Industry, Trade and Investment. He might get a beautiful, uh, a sonorous prose from the government itself. But before he will come to invest, he will most likely call another investor, call a friend that has invested in business and, and ask, how is the environment? Right. How is the legislative environment? How is the regulatory environment? Is it conducive for a business to be sustainable and thrive? If the testimony of the current investors in this environment is negative, right. it is doubtful if such investors will bring their capital to this environment. Well, that is the, the, the message you want to communicate to government. Let us deal with the current challenges that organized businesses are facing. Then it becomes... A cause and effect situation. Indeed. The environment is clean, the well, environment is hospitable, investors will naturally run to this country to invest because we have I think that's a great place to we anchor. We have the people Indeed. and we have everything to, to survive here. Well, that's a great place to anchor. We'd like to thank you so much, Mr. Adewale Smart Oyeride, the DG of NECA. Thank you so much for your time on the program and wish you the very best. Thank you for having us. We'll take a moment now, and when we return, we'll turn our attention to the outcome of the National Assembly Petition Tribunal. Lots of judgments have been given. What's going on? What's the way forward? Stay with us for this one. Well, welcome back. Let's now turn our attention to the series of National Assembly Election Petition Tribunal Judgment. Now, one of the prominent upsets is that of Etiosa Federal Constituency in the nation's commercial capital, Lagos. The tribunal sitting at the Tafar Balewa Square nullified the return of Honorable Tadio Sata of the Labour Party as the duly elected member of the House of Representatives uh, for that constituency. And the court ordered INEC to conduct a supplementary election within 90 days in 32 polling units where elections did not hold. But these were the results as announced uh, by INEC for the three major candidates uh, in that election which was conducted uh, months ago. And you see a breakdown for the Labour Party which was declared winner at that time over 24,000 uh, for the People's Democratic Party's candidate over 18,000 and of course uh, for the APC's candidate, over 16,000 votes. So the court has called for a rerun. And tonight, we will speak with one of the petitioners in the case. Oluban Kole Wellington is the candidate of the People's Democratic Party for that position, House of Reps candidate for Etiosa Federal Constituency, joins us uh, via Zoom on the program tonight. Thank you for joining us uh, on Politics Today. Good evening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me, Jimmy. Thanks for having me on the program. Right. I, I know this is maybe a second chance for you. And you put up a tweet uh, saying it is possible still. But first, for those who may not be conversant with what has played out, can you give us a quick backstory into what the tribunal decided on, particularly in that election? Okay, so what the tribunal basically decided was that um, that we have to go back into the constituency, into specific parts of the constituency to conduct a supplementary election. Um, basically, what we found was when the elections were happening, there were multiple polling units, um, over 30 polling units, and that basically summed up to almost 30,000 people who had their voters' cards, who were ready to vote, but for some reason or another were prevented from voting. So, you know, in some places there was violence, in some places there was voter suppression, in, in other places uh, INEC just wasn't able to show up for some reason or another. But basically, these 30,000 people were prevented from exercising their constitutional rights and prevented from participating in the election. And what the courts have decided, and I'm particularly grateful that the courts decided that every vote deserves to be counted and every voice 
deserves to be heard, regardless of who you're voting for. So even after the elections, I joined hundreds, if not a, almost a thousand volunteers, um, a thousand protesters at the collation center and it was covered by by the news media at the time where people were really frustrated that they didn't get a chance um to participate in that election and i think that that that's important it's an important thing for our democracy that people are not prevented from exercising their constitutional rights to participate in an election um for me personally it's a miracle in and of itself that we get another chance to finish the election i think it's a testament to the power of perseverance, uh, the power of faith, and the collective will of the people who want to participate in the rebuilding of this democracy. So it can only be a positive, and uh, by God's grace, I believe we'll, we'll come out okay. But I'd like to get your perspective to this, because your opponent, the candidate of the Labour Party, also put up a tweet uh, saying that he wants to clarify that he was not sacked. Do you agree with that uh, assertion? Well, I mean, you know, the, the court has decided what it's decided. Um, and, you know, according to what their decision is, uh, he is supposed to, uh, as, the way that the judgment was read to us was that he has to return. Um, uh, the, I mean, the, the certificate of, re of return has to be withdrawn from him. And the court considers the election still ongoing um, and, that, and that it's not done. And we have to go back and finish the election for us to decide the winner. Now, um, however, you know, anyone wants to interpret that is completely fine and it's up to them. We can only abide by the letter of the law and what the court has said. Um, I also personally don't like to focus on what anyone else is saying or what anyone else is doing. I, I really like to focus on my own candidacy and what the issues are and the chance that we have for the people that do believe in us and believe that we can provide a TSA with true representation and servant leadership and compassion and the kinds of representation that we've been missing, you know, all of these years. Um, I believe that we have a chance to do that. So, you know, based on what the court has decided, you know, we're, we're willing to go back um, into the field and, and contest this election. And I'm, and I'm optimistic. I'm, I'm genuinely optimistic. You know, interestingly, this is not your first time out. So let's talk about your chances this time. The Labour Party won the first time out. I'm talking about the election held some months ago and it perhaps the candidate he perhaps just leaned on the obedient movement's popularity which is quite interesting because the obedience may love your music like a lot of nigerians do but doesn't look like they love your politics so how do you plan to work around that okay so you know the truth is but i mean i don't know enough about um the opponent who is currently in the lead in the election. I did try to look up some information about him. I couldn't find that many videos of him speaking about his policies and, and all of that. I couldn't find a lot of information. But like I said before, I'm not the type of person who would try and downgrade anyone. I'm, I'm not here to play politics the dirty way or to slander or look down on anyone. Um, I'd rather focus on myself, who I am and who I'm not, and focus on the opportunity that Etiosa has been given to make a choice, you know. Um, I'm the kind of representative that believes in true servant leadership, that believes in ac accountability and transparency and communication. I'm not the kind of person that, if I am given a chance to serve, and this is completely up to the people, but if I am given that chance to serve, you know, they won't just hear from me in tweets, you know, once in a while. I'll be out there, I'll be engaging, you know, they will, they'll be carried along at every step of the way. Um, I'll be here front and center. I've been here for years. Um, like you said, yes, we were caught up in a wave and, you know, there's nothing we can do about that. But I think now this is it's clearly a choice between three people and, you know, the, the uh, constituents who do have an opportunity to show up have to realize the immense power that they have to make this choice. This is about the representation for ATOSA. This is about having a true voice. For, our, for the good people of Etiosa in the House of Representatives. It's about having a chance to have somebody who will engage and communicate and fight for our people and speak for them and serve them. This is about some, you know, having the chance to have someone who has a track record of doing these things. That's who I've always been. And whether I win the election or not, that is who I will continue to be. I believe, I strongly believe that is, it is possible for Etiosa to have good representation 
and we can be the model of true representation for the nation to gauge itself against. So, you know, we're, we're appealing to our people and that's all we can do. I have a strong conviction to serve. I believe that that is what I was called to do. Um, and, you know, if I am given that opportunity, that is what I will deliver. But, you know, like you said, it's completely up to the people who they'll choose. At this point, it's not about, at least for Etiosa, this rerun is not about the presidential conversation or the state conversation. This is a simple question. Mm -hmm. You know, all eyes on Etiosa, the battle for Etiosa. Who would you rather speak for you, fight for you, speak with you, serve you, and serve alongside you to bring about the kind of representation that we've been missing in this constituency for all of these years? Um, and I, you know, the analysis... Okay, go ahead, sorry. You can land on that point, the analysis, you said. So the analysis says that we stand a very good chance of turning this thing around because the areas that they happened to prevent the election from, from occurring happen to be some of the strongest areas that I have. It's where I've done the most community service work. It's, it's in Ogombo, it's in uh, Ilado, it's in Aja, in Shangutedo, it's in, in the parts of Etiosa where I am particularly strong, where we have true believers, true supporters, thousands of volunteers, people who really connect with our values and our vision for what Nigeria can be and what this constituency can be. So I honestly, I really do like our chances. Now, granted, there are challenges with getting people to come out um, for a supplementary election because, you know, there's apathy that will set in and people who were disenfranchised the first time around. I mean, I've, I've engaged with people on the ground. I've been out talking to my constituents. There were people who were waiting from morning till night and INEC never showed up. There were people who came to the polling booth and found that they didn't have House of Reps ballot papers. There were people who had to run uh, uh, from from uh, rumors and, and incidents of violence. So the, the people in Etiosa have been through a lot. Talk less of, you know, the NSAS um, situation. And so we've been through a lot in this constituency. Um, and I'm willing to, 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 to bet that based on all of these things, we will find enough people to come out, participate in this supplementary election and make what they believe is the right choice. And by the grace of God, hopefully that choice will be me. Right. So let's wind down with this one. I mean, the court has given 90 days for the elections to be conducted in 32 polling units, barring any changes. But you will need a lot of support. And I imagine you've probably gotten to work already. So uh, how much support are you getting from the national level, uh, from the state level, not forgetting the issues within your party at the national level as well. So are you getting that support? Who are you looking to, uh, the NWC for support? Are you reaching out to individual leaders? How are you playing this game? Yes, so I have to say, and I, I really have to acknowledge um, the PDP, the leadership of the PDP, the stakeholders of the PDP, the members of the party at the state level and the national level, because they have been incredibly supportive and encouraging to me uh, just in this entire process and just standing with me and giving me whatever support that they can offer at this time. I also have to acknowledge that there are some of our supporters who have various political ideologies and I think that this is the moment that we can look beyond. Uh, this is not this is not an election just for the PDP and for the people who have been incredibly supported in the PDP. But this is for anybody who shares a like passion for what we believe that Nigeria can be. And at the end of the day, if I do become the representative, I'm not the representative just of my party. I will be the representative for the whole for the, the whole of Etiosa. Right. And so we are, you know, in the, we were reaching out across the aisle to say. I'm willing to work with anybody, anybody who wants a better country, anybody who wants a better constituency. I'm the guy that can work with you, that will sit down with you, that will speak to you, that right. you will hear from, that will not disappear and show up in tweets once in a while, that you will hear from me and you can hold me accountable. My entire career, my entire business life as an entrepreneur in the entertainment sector in media and marketing, in the food business, uh, in my work in the church, I'm you know, I, I believe, I strongly believe that I'm, I'm perfectly positioned right. for Etiosa to have the kind of representation that we've been needing. So, you know, we're willing to work with everybody, anybody right. who shares, who has a like mind, um, who wants uh, the kind of representation okay. that, that we deserve and that we've been missing. And let me just land on this. 
Okay, we have to um, anchor now, but quickly. Oh, okay, let me land on this quickly. I believe that regardless of what happens, leadership is about resilience and having the courage to stand for what you believe in, even if you have to stand in one. And I hope that the people in Etios and the people around Nigeria will identify and, and see value in the resilience and the courage and the doggedness that we've shown. And, you know, we're appealing to, to everybody in ATS to please come out. If you are eligible to vote in this election, come out and let's yeah. bring this thing home. We can make history. I strongly believe it. It is still possible. God bless right. you. Thank you for having me on the well, a lot of people know you as Banky W. You're hoping to become Honorable Bankoli Wellington. Thank you so much uh, for your time on the program this evening. God bless you. Thank you for having me. Right. And just to mention that we did invite uh, the candidate of the Labour Party as well, Honorable Atat, to join us on the show. Uh, but clearly that didn't happen. Let's shift gears now on the program. This time, we're turning our attention to Ondo State. There's still a lot of confusion as to what exactly is playing out that after Governor Rotimi Akiridulu sacked all of the media aides attached to the office of his deputy, uh, Honorable Loki Ayedatiwa. Well, on the program tonight, we seek to get some more insight into what's, what's playing out in Ondo State. We're joined uh, by Dr. Doni uh, Odebowale, who is the SA to the Ondo State governor on special duties he joins us virtually on the program tonight just to shed light on what's going on is this a drama we've seen what is going on in ondo state so uh, let's get more on this thank you for joining us uh, on the program uh, dr odebowale yeah good, good evening so first things first i mean it's important to ask uh, how is the governor acclimatizing back to work after three months on medical leave i imagine a lot of nigerians will want to know how he's faring he's, he's back in the country and he's, he's he's fine very much so he's he has started to work and he has started to work and uh, i can tell you that uh, i've been instructed to to carry out and the SSA on special duties and strategy. So he, I was with him about two days ago and he, he asked me to, to embark on certain assignments and if the times I'm here. Indeed. So he's handling all of the pressures that come with the work. He's handling handling it quite well, you say. What, what pressures? What pressures? You see, there is this um, erroneous belief that once you are a governor, but the governor of a state, then every everything must come to you. It is not so. Why do you have your assistants? Why do you have your commissioners? Why do you have all of these people? I mean, everybody. Look, the governor cannot be everywhere. This idea of you know creating the impression that the governor must be a superhuman being who does not fall sick, who must attend to all files, who must see everybody, is is a misnomer. It doesn't work that way doesn't work that way and he was away happens. for three months my office has not stopped working for a day for one day the governor will not go to arakale market to clear the road i will do that the governor will not you know try to help crisis in the in the state that is my job that is my job so i will not wait for the governor to come and do that so whoever wants to see the governor for any specific the governor had a meeting while he was in germany he had an ESCO meeting via Zoom. We should avail ourselves of the, the benefits of you know technology too. You know, people should should stop being hypocritical. The governor received members of ESCO Indeed. at his office in the battle. And did. that's the essence of and delegation so anyway. Right. Uh, I didn't mean. I said essentially that's the essence of delegation and we of course wish the governor uh, all the very best. It was cherry precisely, to see him uh, return to the country for a lot of people who had been following this story. But let's get into this, oh, well, what do we call it now? Is it uh, a controversy? Is it a drama? A lot of people don't know what to call it. Why did the governor sack his deputies' media aides? What exactly is going on, doctor? Well, I think uh, only, the, only the governor, because the governor appointed all of us. Only the governor and the deputy governor enjoy immunity. And there's a laid down procedure. Section 188 of the Constitution is clear on how either of them can be removed from office. 
any other person is expendable. Every other person in the in the government owes his or her appointment to the government at his pleasure. For good or bad reason, he may decide to remove you. That's all. If, I mean, if, if you enjoy the confidence of the governor, you are appointed to serve the people of the state. If he feels that you are no longer you know, needed, you, you go. You go. That's the way it is. So he was the one that the people of Ondo State voted for. Yeah, no, so no appointee was voted for by the people of Ondo State. Okay, yes. so is it because of something they did or something they did not do? You'd understand why a lot of people are thinking, "What's going on here?" Because it's similar to what we've seen playing out in neighboring Edo State. So, uh, what could they have done to warrant such? No, I, I'm not in position to tell you about what they did and what they did not do. The governor appointed them. You see, they were appointed for a purpose. If they did not discharge the responsibilities, the duties of that of, of the offices for which they were appointed, the governor reserves the right to ask them to go. He reserves the right to, I mean, he, he alone has the constitutional responsibility to appoint. He, he, whoever appoints can disappoint, part of my language. So he has, he has decided to 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 dispense with their services uh, you know so yes, speak I, to us about the relationship between the governor and his deputy uh, honorable ayedatiwa what is the state of their relationship did he sign off perhaps was he aware was he aware of this sacking before it happened because i imagine if they have a good relationship he may have told him well this is what i'm about to do so it doesn't catch you unawares uh, speak to us about that yes is the, is the, is the, uh, the way this thing works this thing works is that when the governor wants to appoint anybody, if you take any name to the governor, he must convince the governor that the person will add value to governance. Uh, the person is a person that should join us, and of course, if he if 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 feels otherwise too, then there's no, I mean, he doesn't owe anybody any 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 explanation as to what, what he wants to do. Talking about the relationship, I know that the governor and the deputy still met some two days ago. Yeah, they, 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 there's no problem at all. I don't want to believe that what is happening in those states is what uh, we are following. No, we cannot follow those states. This is on those states. On those states, we do what is right. You know, the primary purpose of governance, you know, is the welfare of the people. We must serve the people. We must relegate politicking to the background. So the governor is not interested in this petty politics that people have reduced the whole state to in his absence. Yeah, I can uh, tell you for free. Yes. When was the, when was the way? There was little of governors. I can tell you little of governors. When was the way? Yeah. People wanting to contest, they want to be governor, they want to be this, they want to be that. It is within their right. But they were distracting us. They are distracting us. And they were recruiting people to be distracted. They were distracting us. So the governor is not petty. It's not petty. So, uh, I mean, he was in Germany. He was he was asking people questions about about this. He was sending transformers. He was calling them to go and fix it, to go and do that. So, contrary to the to the to the erroneous impression he conveyed that he was he was he was seriously incapacitated. He was this, he was that. Now he's back. Right. He's back. Nobody's talking about about, about the shenanigans that went on. When was the week? So these are I mean, shenanigans you, you refer to, uh, really. You say that it's geared towards the coming elections. Uh, and, and I wonder, really, if the governor... No, no, I didn't say that. No, I didn't say that. Removal of um, press secretaries. No, no, you said the it's shenanigans it's, it's, going on uh, was for people who want to repeat. Shenanigans, yes, I said that. And I repeat people it. did not focus on shenanigans governance. Shenanigans, it's about the election, and the governor is not protesting exactly. again. And you, and you said very little governance happened. And that was under the deputy governor who was acting in his stead. So, uh, they are concerned. So, what would we see happen next? Is it a possible impeachment only he can, or only a relocation? Only he can answer that. Only he can explain. But I tell you, as a member of this government, as a member of this government, I was appalled at some of the things that happened. Is the, the governor, governor was, against the governor his deputy was contesting? Sorry, sir? Is, is the governor mean, against his mean, deputy mean, contesting in the next election? No, he has not told me so. He has not told anybody so. But I, I mean, because we are in this state, 
we know that certain members of this cabinet are contesting and some people who are outside too want to contest and that is legitimate it is legitimate but what we what we ask of them is that they should not distract us you know they were posting the obituaries of their father and not the governor more than five times posting the governor's obituary they wanted power they wanted power power to do what not to serve the people they were overheating the policy they were overheating the politics. Power, power, transmit power, power. We want money. We want to fund, fund, fund like that. They created the impression that the governor was not in charge of anything. They picked on the first family, abusing everybody. They cannot deny it. And I'm not saying that deputy governor is, but I'm saying that these people they know themselves. So no governor will sit down and watch that happen. The people of the state voted for him are not these people. They voted for him and the deputy, of course, the deputy was beat by him to run with him. They should allow him to die first. Right. Know, that's that's in certainly... Decent, in decent haste. That's certainly it's not something we wish, we wish for. Uh, uh, in, indeed. That's certainly not something we wish for, Dr. Debowali. But let's wind down on this. So if the government is surrounded, if the governor, rather, is surrounded by uh, such animosity, if I can use that term as you've described it. How does he plan to go on, complete his tenure? What is the game plan here? Because governance is a big Look, picture you, for the people of Ondo State. The, the, the governor of Ondo State, Arakmori, Uluwado Timiate, Dolu, S-A-N-C-O-N, was the president of, of Nigerian Bar Association. I was with him, I'm a lawyer too. He was the president of, he's, a, he's, he's the quintessential gentleman of the bar. Ask about Akiti in bar politics. So Aketi, Aketi we, we, you know, we are not distracted. We are not distracted, you know. He's back. He's back. Right. He has assumed office. They wanted him to come back. They were abusing everybody. He's back. And whoever does not, if he feels that um, Donyo Debole, you know, does not fit into his new program, he try, I, I will go back to my charge and bill. What's the problem there? If oh, you are very appointed, interesting when you put go. it there. What is uh, the about them? Uh, Right. I would like to thank you so much, uh, Dr. Doni Odebowale. I know a lot of people also know you for your activism. Uh, he's the SSA to the Ondo State Governor on special duties. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your time. I will wish the governor the very best, sound health, and uh, all of the best. I thank you very much for having me. I thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, that's been the package for tonight, everyone. Thank you for watching. I'm Kairo Kikilu. We're back again tomorrow with more fresh political stories. Good night.